All right, we're in Romans chapter 6 today. Uh, been, uh, been doing good to do about a chapter a week, and uh, I think we're going to keep be able to keep that up. Uh, there will be in uh, late August and early September, a couple of weeks, we're going to have some substitute teachers in because um, John has asked me to preach. But right now the plan is we're going to go until the first week of October. Then after that, uh, if this, you know, the 1030, there's, we're just going to keep having something here. The, the plan after Romans is to do a series on Christian ethics um, and hot button issues. You know, we're going to be around the election season and we're going to talk through, okay, how do we, how do we process as Christians the debates that are raging in our world? Okay, um, so as, as we get closer there, you know, I have like some like common hot button ones, but if there's there's ones that you want to especially make sure that uh, that we hit, um, if you could let me know or shoot me an email or something, I see how that can if that can work into the list. Um, but uh, but I'm pretty excited about that one because you know we 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 read all this stuff in scripture. Uh, but then we're going to get to Romans 12. It says, be transformed by the renewing of your minds. And then you will be able to test and approve of what God's will is. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. Uh, so when it comes to all the, all the debates of the world, you know, whether that's political or culture, the way a Christian thinks about things, the, the, the way that that I would say Jesus approaches things is not the way of the world. Okay? So the, the world, the left and the right, the red and the blue, Republicans, Democrats, is like a zero sum game. Okay, we have to win, which means the other side has to lose. You gotta own the libs, you gotta own the Republicans. And a lot of times we look at it from a, a kingdom of God lens, you're like, Okay, it, it not only matters what we fight about, but how we fight that battle. You know, um, if, I, if I go in and, and, you know, destroy my enemies, but I don't also show the love of Christ, <laughs> you know, speak the truth in love type of thing. So, so we're going to look at all that and... Um, and and it's, it's coming up. It's going to be in October. I'm, I'm starting to try to get prepared for some of that. Um, and I, it's, it's going to stretch us by design. Because if we're not actually stretching our, our discernment muscles, um, then we're just listening to the talking points of our favorite news, news hosts, then... That we're not really doing our jobs. Okay. Um, but that's coming up. That's coming up in October. So right now, Romans chapter 6. Uh, and of course, remember, we're looking for keywords. <clears throat> keywords that uh, Paul brings out. He's laying out this, this uh, argument for Christian unity and salvation to the church in Rome, a mix of Gentile Christians, Jewish Christians, divided over, over what, what makes someone part of the people of God. Okay? Uh, the Jewish Christians over here look at the Gentiles. Well, they're not doing all these works of the law. Sabbath, uh, keeping kosher, uh, you know, circumcision. Okay, these are these are the markers that separate the Jews from everyone else. I mean, you know, even the pagans have laws: don't murder. Okay, you know that doesn't necessarily is a distinguishing mark. But these works of the law is a it's a phrase. It doesn't mean 
Okay, all the 613 commandments in the law, but these markers, identity markers of the Jewish people. So they're looking and saying, okay, well, this is what the Jewish, this is what the God's people are supposed to look like, do, practice. These Gentiles aren't doing it, so they're not part of the people of God. But the Gentiles over here are saying, but it's about Jesus, isn't it? And so Paul wants to go to Rome, you, you know, be part of the church there, and be a springboard okay, to the rest of the world, just like some of our global partners are part of our community here, and then we launch them, support them to go to various parts of the world. <clears throat> so to do that, he's writing to this church to try to deal with this so that when he gets there, they're united and are able to launch him, help him get to Spain. Okay, uh, so he made the case all are, you know, all have sinned. Okay, that was chapters one and two. And then we get into um, we are righteous by faith. All right, we're righteous. We are marked as God's covenant people by faith, and he's referring to Abraham. Okay, the covenant that God made with Abraham, it was made before circumcision and before the law. Okay? Abraham believed God. He had faith in God. He trusted God. And God counted it as righteous. And then chapter 5, we remember we had this whole uh, Adam and Christ picture <laughs> that... Uh, there's two humanities. And both Jews and Gentiles go back to the original humanity, which is in Adam. Remember, I used the illustration of two boats. Okay? Adam, the captain of the boat, the SS humanity, has steered it into an iceberg. And because he steered us wrong, set us on the wrong course. That ship is sinking. And so our only hope is to get off that boat and onto the HMS Christ, His Majesty Ship Christ. We have to transfer our allegiance from Adam to Christ. Now, again, this is, this is contrary to, to the way the Jews were growing up. The Jews grew up thinking, okay, there's, there's two. There's Jews and there's everyone else. Paul well, says, no, no, no. There's Christ and there's everyone else. Okay? So I've been uh, uh, engaging with a, a Bible scholar, uh, N.T. Wright, and, and he points out something that I don't think we pay enough attention to about Jesus. So, uh, all right, so I'm going to put this aside, okay? We're going to do a little parenthetical here before we get back into, into the text. Um, there is this huge pie of humanity Okay. This is all of Adam's descendants. Now, of this huge pie, God chose a portion of that pie, the descendants of Abraham, to make a covenant with. But not all the descendants of Abraham, right? Because Abraham had more sons than just Isaac. It was Ishmael, but the covenant wasn't through Ishmael. The covenant was through Isaac. Isaac had two sons, Jacob and Esau. But God made, God said, no, it's not through Esau, it's through Jacob. Okay? 
So really, we're talking about the descendants of Jacob, whose name gets changed to what in Genesis? Israel. Israel. Okay. So out of humanity, God selects a portion, Israel, for this covenant and this purpose. Now, the purpose for which God selected Israel wasn't, it wasn't because Israel was so great. The people of Israel have a long history of being really not so great. The purpose of Israel was to inherit the covenant promises through whom God would rescue the world from sin. Okay? Covenant to Abraham, through your descendants, all nations will be blessed. Even going further than that, the promise to Adam and Eve, uh, one, there will be enmity between the woman and the serpent, and a seed of the serpent, a, a, a child of the serpent, or of the woman, excuse me, child of the woman will crush the head of the serpent. In other words, Satan will be defeated, and along with Satan, we can lump in sin and death and all the consequences of that. So we're going to undo the fall. Israel was selected. Now, Israel was given the law to see, to, to be shown this is what God's will is. Now, there are some parts in Romans 5, we didn't, um, 5, and also it, it comes up in, in 7 as well, that there's, there's no, where there's no law, there's no trespass. Where there's no law, there's, uh, it, it's kind of like, oh, what are, you, what are you talking about? There's no law, there's no sin? No, no, there was sin, and there was death. From the time of Adam, but the law spells out clearly what sin is. So there's sin, you know, the Gentiles who don't have the law, they can still sin, right? They still do wrong, they still murder, they still steal, all that. But they had not yet identified as sin, right? Yeah, the law, the law is the measuring stick that says, here's what God's will is is okay so now you know you know it's one thing a kid steals a lot you know a toddler steals a toy from another kid okay it's a toddler he doesn't know any better once you've told them this is wrong then he does it <laughs> now he's not just stealing from now he's disobeying a command that he knew Ahead of time. Okay? So Israel has the law. So in other words, Israel's offense is in some ways even greater because compared to the Gentiles, you really should know better. All right? Bill? But they had this opportunity so that they could also see they cannot do it. Yeah, it's... Yeah, it's a, it's a, uh, you know, the law is powerless. We're, we're going to see that here in uh, in chapter eight. The law is powerless <laughs> because the law can't affect human hearts. The law is good, but the law, this good thing, is going to be used by sin, this evil thing, to basically compound the evil of sin because now you know better and sometimes it's even you have the law yet you're told don't do this that makes it even more compelling right and then jesus made it i guess you could say that much more tougher when he used two of the laws and expanded on them the, the law of hating someone or murdering someone because if, if you say well i've never murdered anybody have you ever hated it's the same, he says. And then same yeah. thing, committing adultery. You know, it's not, you don't have to touch them. 
All you have to do is lust in your heart after them. So after hearing them too, yeah, what it's, chance it's, do you have? Yeah, because yeah. it's it's about the heart. So yeah. there's there's a way in which um, you know Israel is kind of uh, uh, sin is getting more concentrated. Um, now I'm using that as a metaphor. There, you think about. Uh, you know, you got you got something on the in the pot boiling, and you, you, the, 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 you heat it up. You know, the water boils off. Whatever's there is is more concentrated. Does that make sense? So <clears throat> Israel is in a sense, you know, experiencing sin concentrated because they have the law. And they have this relationship with God, not as a, okay, I can see from creation there is a God, but a revealed God who has said, here I am, and they're still rebelling. And then out of Israel, there's chosen one, the Christ. Uh, in In the prophets, there's... There's almost this this conflation that the Christ, the Messiah, is Israel in the form of a person. Uh, you, you read through uh, you read through Isaiah. It's it talks about uh, you know my servant. Okay. Uh, especially uh, Isaiah 52 and 53, this very beautiful, very powerful uh, suffering servant passage. Uh, he will uh, bear our transgressions. Um, uh, the, on him was the punishment that brought us peace. But through Isaiah, it, it gets kind of muddled because elsewhere the servant is Israel. But then the servant is a person, a a singular person. (coughs) And so, especially when we get into uh, Romans 9, 10, and 11 about, okay, has God fulfilled his promises to Israel? Well, in the sense that Christ represents Israel, He is the true Israelite. He is the true one because he fulfilled Israel's part of the covenant. You know, God has this covenant with Israel. I'm going to do these things, and you're you're supposed to do these things. None of the Israelites did, did their part of it except for Jesus. And so he is uh, not only the... The epitome of humanity is also the epitome of Israel, which is why through Christ, God fulfills the covenant. All the promises of God are yes in Christ. And he fulfills that covenant, and God is righteous in the sense that he is very he is faithful, he's he fulfills his promise, his promise to David, one of your descendants will always sit on your throne. Well, in terms of a lot of David's children, uh, it was about five five hundred BC the Davidic kingdom ended. But who's the one who always sits on the throne? Christ. So the the promises of of okay in, inheriting the rule over the nations. Well. Uh, the kingdom of Israel, the, the nation state of Israel, there were, it was gone for a long time. And yet there is one who rules over all the nations. So Jesus is this representative, just like we were talking about the two humanities. So in a sense, the Jewish people were right that it was Israel and everyone else. It's just really the epitome of Israel is is Jesus, who is the Messiah, and the uh, the rest of the Israelites are, are really everyone else. Thank yeah. you for that. I've, I've read 
Um, a lot of evidently false information is what you just said just made perfect sense. There, there, I've read information that thought that it was still going to be an earthly throne and later in the future, the throne of David, that a king would come, you know, to actual physical earth to be a government head. But Christ was that. And is that still? Yeah, and, and there's there's some who who still hold to that. I mean, it, it's I don't want you to say like okay, all these other people are wrong because there, there's when you're getting into future stuff. I mean, he knows, not not us. The Book of Revelation does talk about millennial kingdom, and you you have some who believe that Jesus will come and reign physically on earth. For a thousand years, uh, and then there's going to be another rebellion, and then the end will come. There's uh, so that's millennial view. Uh, uh, so premillennialists kind of hold that we're in front of the we are pre we're in front of the millennium's coming in the future. Um, there's a group that's called postmillennialists who kind of like. The, the kingdom of God being the church is expanding and making the world better and we are creating the, the millennial rule okay as as the church advances in the world um, that that view kind of lost sway after World War II <laughs> yeah. everyone's like oh we're, everything's getting better technology science we're, we're learning so much we're going to <laughs> utopia Oh no, we're just going to use it to kill us, kill everybody. Eh. Yeah. Then there's a, a view called ah millennialism that sees this millennial reign of Christ as a image, a a metaphor in the Book of Revelation. Not that it would be a literal one thousand years on Earth, but um, uh, within that type of literature of of the book of Revelation, apocryphal literature, numbers have meanings, and numbers in multiples have meanings. So 10 times 10 times 10, 10 being completion. So this complete reign of Jesus. Um, and, and quite frankly, I tend to lean towards the amillennial view. I know TC is more of the premillennial, and we will see. <laughs> We, we will see. Well, if he didn't have to rule with an iron scepter, I would be able to, to accept that a little better. But because the iron scepter only shows it had to be flesh. Or there's no reason to have an iron scepter. There's no reason to rule with an iron scepter if you're not, if, because if, once we're in our glorified bodies, we're not sinning. So if you have to rule with an iron scepter, you there, there's judgments going on. And that can only be for flesh, to, yeah. or you wouldn't be necessary. Yeah, the, the, and, the, and I'll be honest, I mean, that's a, that's a really good point. The struggle that I have is that Jesus is going to reign, but then evil is still going to rebel. You know, it's like, we're going to go through all of this. He comes, he comes out to earth, puts everything to right for a thousand years just for it to all go to pot again, and then have the final battle again. And then right. it's, but these are things. These are things of God, and you know, bro brothers say, "I don't know." Yeah, <laughs> well, Israel's been promised that, and that, and if they would have fulfilled it already at any given time, they just haven't. And then you, when you get to the like uh, Zechariah and all them, tell you about what's going on during that period of time, and it's it, it is amazing how the world will be. Like it, well, there will be no killing if a man dies as a hunter, he dies as a child. Because even though if you don't have killing, the wolf and the lamb will lay down together and all these things, which happened originally. In the garden, the lamb and the wolf would have laid down. There would have been, you know, they eat grass or whatever. There was no killing. But I, it, yes, the, if, if when I see that plan of God, I, I see the same thing. Why did we have to have, I understand it's flesh, and we guess we shouldn't be surprised if man rebels while Christ is on the earth because they already have. They've already, in, in the 40, in the wilderness, 
I mean, they seen God let them buy a this. He gave them yeah. manna. And they, you know, we live by faith. They got to see and they still rebelled. And they got they eye, they got to see it yeah. by an eye and they still rebelled. Yeah. So so all of this will will kind of put a pin into it if we come back to the book of Revelation or, or Daniel or something uh, in the future. But uh, but we do see this idea playing out in Paul that that Christ is the ultimate Israelite. Okay. He is the one who kept Israel's side of the covenant. And, and he is the inheritor of God's promises. And then the, the, all the rest of us, we inherit through Christ, which is what we see in <clears throat> Romans 6. So somebody get for us uh, Romans 6, 1 through 4. What shall we say then? We are to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died in sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus are baptized into his death? We, are the bur <coughs> we were buried therefore with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead, by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Right. Again, yeah. Well, one of my favorite passages of Scripture, <clears throat> for one, because I think it gives us a clear picture of what baptism is all about. Um, you know, there have been, you know, we're uh, church people, debate, humans debate about everything, including baptism. Mm -hmm. Is baptism just an outward sign of an inward change? Da, 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 da. My best description of baptism comes from here is that it is a covenant ritual. Just like a marriage ceremony where two are pledging their lives to each other. And at the end of the marriage ceremony, the two are now one. And we don't ask silly questions like if, if the, the bride is on the way to the altar and the groom has a heart attack. Is she now a widow? You know, we, we trust that at the end of the, of the ceremony, the two are one. And same way with baptism. Like, oh, if you're going to the baptistry to get baptized and you get hit by a bus and you die, are you going to heaven? I, I'll let God sort that out. But I trust what Scripture says that in baptism we are united with Christ in a, in a very real way. Now that doesn't mean I say, you know, everybody who, who either was never taught or were baptized as infants or whatever. That's God. God sort that out. And he's just and he's loving God. He's going to make a right decision. But in baptism... We are dying down. We, we're, leaving, we're leaving Adam's boat. And we are placing our allegiance with Christ as a captain of a new humanity. And so the question he asks here, should, should we go on sinning? Has anybody ever had a question like that? Or, or maybe, maybe you ask a question like that. It's, okay, if I'm saved by grace, then it really doesn't matter what I do. I think that what that passage says to us in really this whole chapter in the book of Romans is that the most important thing is to not use it as an excuse, to not wow. go easy on ourselves all the time. You know, I'm saved by Christ's grace. It doesn't matter what I do, you know. Oh, it wasn't that big of a deal. I make excuses all the time. My wife gets on me all the time. <laughs> and it's like, there's no excuse. You're a new creation. Act like it. Yeah. Yeah, and it is a fine line because on the one hand, we don't want to give Satan ammunition for shame, which can then be counterproductive and shame can actually lead us to sin because, well... You know, I feel bad. I don't want to feel bad. 
doing this over here makes me at least not think about feeling bad for a while. So, uh, so we don't want to give Satan ammunition for shame, but you're right. We don't want to be laissez-faire, like, oh, I can just do whatever. Fill your... I kind of take that thought or idea about uh, with God's grace should we continue uh, because we can expect more grace. I kind of consider that at that point, that's forgiveness of past sins. But understand that it isn't grace for reckless future. Yeah, I think I think reckless is is a key word there. I, I like to talk about grace covered obedience. You know, there's there is grace when I'm trying to follow, but I have a bad day. However unintentional sin is a lot different than me just saying, okay, God, I'm really just going to do whatever I want here. <laughs> so, so yeah, because his point is, re remember where you live now. You, you, you no longer live in Adam, ruled by sin. Now you live in Christ. You have been baptized. You have pledged your allegiance. So, uh, so a couple of illustrations I like to use. Uh, you used to play for the Green Bay Packers. You wore the Packers jersey. You scored points for the Packers. You used the Packers playbook. Now you've been traded or you free agent. You signed with the Colts. That's right. So you change your jersey. You learn a new playbook. You have a new coach, and you, you score points for a new team. So, so going back and saying, well, okay, I'm just going to go back to my old lifestyle, that's like you know, you're wearing the Colts jersey, but you're, you're still scoring points for Green Bay. It doesn't work that way, does it? You are on a new team. Uh, another, another illustration uh, this one I got from uh, uh, Matt Chandler, uh, pastor in, in Dallas, Texas. He talked about he used to live on this road. Okay, so he had to he had to come up here and take a left turn at this stoplight. Okay, here's a little ugly stop sign. So for for years, up here, turn left. Up here, turn left. Then they moved over here to a new house. Now you gotta go here and turn right. Now it took him a while because, you know, for the first couple of months, he'd still like, oh, he's not thinking about it, he turns left. It's like, oh, wait a minute, I don't live here anymore. I've got to retrain my brain, my soul, my, my heart to go up here and turn right where I used to turn left. And so we think about this, okay, I'm in this situation, somebody has disrespected me, I used to escalate with my words or, or with my fists. Now, I gotta learn to turn the other cheek. I like that analogy, because the left is wrong and the right is wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we, Baptism is this beautiful picture <laughs> that uh, you are now in Christ. You are in this covenant relationship, a lot like marriage. You have pledged your life, died to your old life. And the, the baptism formula the ancient church used to use, you know, do you renounce Satan and all his works? You know? And it might be something worth bringing that one back because yeah. sometimes in church we, we forget that it's like, oh, this isn't just a get, get, your, get out of hell free card. This is a, I'm no longer living over here. I'm no longer in Adam. I am joining Christ. And he is now my king. Okay. That could be converted to the forks in the road and one side's the wide road. And the other side is the narrow road. It's yeah. Not as, it's not as well traveled. Yeah. Because, I mean, yeah. 
A absolutely. Absolutely. But, but the bummer is many will find the wide and few will find the narrow and it's a bummer that this most of humanity is going to reject mm -hmm. and that's too bad but we shouldn't be surprised because he, Jesus did all those miracles and all for that three three and a half years as it is and and what he get uh, 120 while he was in the flesh and then after he was resurrected I think they, I think Paul speaks of 500 believers but yeah. clearly I would, he clearly you would, if you looked at numbers you wouldn't think he was successful course that's God but that's different but you know from a, us humans look at numbers mm -hmm. and and his it, it, you know 120 out of all the miracles but that's what even Jesus said if you don't believe me at least believe the miracles he was trying everything he could to to get them to see but yep yeah I love it in the book of John I was reading the book of John at the end he says many more miracles he did he said all the books of the world probably couldn't contain what he did while he was on the earth. Mm -hmm. The miracles and wonders. Yeah. So. Now, and here's the thing, you know, you talk about numbers, okay, one miracle with, or two miracles with numbers is the feeding of the, of the multitudes. Mm -hmm. You know, 4,000 men, not counting women and children, 6,000 men, not counting women and children. And they come and they want Jesus to be king. They want him to be king, to rule a nation. Um, and he said, no, that's that's not what I'm about. Your view of what God's kingdom is is not what God's kingdom actually is. Now, here's the sad reality. There are a number of people, even churches today, who still want that Davidic king type Jesus. Only it's with the American flag instead of for the Jewish people. Good, good. They want something similar to a very generous, very loving, earthly father. Well, I'm not. I'm not sure. I'd say that they. There is a strand. Uh, you see this especially with the group called the New Apostolic Reformation, um, and. Some come at it, but they, they, they want dominion. They want power. Okay. A control. A, yeah. That basically it's it's this synchronism of Christianity and Americanism. And I say it not you know America as it is, but Americanism, this ideal of America that they want, and. And, and basically, I, I, I really think that if, if Jesus actually ruled America according to the kingdom of God, and according to, again, this gets into the ethics stuff we were talking about, they wouldn't like it. Because some of what Jesus does is, is not actually following their politics. <laughs> yeah. You know, their opinions and wants. Yeah, yeah. Neither political party is baptized. All right? They're... Some of the like, okay, well, some of that, yeah, that this aligns with our Christian mm -hmm. values, but both of them, you look at it as like, I don't think Jesus would be either one. Okay? Now, you could argue, would he be more with one or more than the other? The thing is, Jesus doesn't do lesser of two evils. <laughs> so, right, absolute wrong. So, we, and the thing is, we can all. It's idolatry. We can pursue our own kingdom. Take it out of the political sphere, put it in your personal sphere. I want Jesus to build my kingdom versus I submit to his kingdom. And, and that's kind of what I'm, what I'm getting at. That, uh, the multitudes, they wanted Jesus to build their kingdom. So anyway, we got, we got a lot. We're four verses into chapter 6. Somebody get verses 5 through 11 for us. If we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. 
Yeah, down to the first oh, level. to 11. I'm sorry. I thought you said seven. My enemy told me it was seven. <laughs> now, if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once. But in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Okay. So this idea of being free from sin. Now, some take this to like an absolute extreme. It's like, no, if you're if you're really saved, you should not sin anymore at all, ever. My personal experience, I'm still struggling with sin. Okay. So, what does it mean to be free from sin? Um, there's there's different ideas of freedom. Uh, and, and sometimes we, especially in America, we kind of bring in our American idea of freedom, the freedom to do anything I want. However, there's another view of freedom, which freedom is the ability to do what you want, to do what is good. Um, so before... Before we were baptized, when we were living in Adam, we were not free to not sin. We could do anything we wanted. I mean, we had the ability to sin, to lust, to do, you know. But what we were incapable of doing <coughs> was telling sin no. Now in Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit, we have the ability to to change to we, we're not beholden to making the making the turn now we can choose differently doesn't mean it's boom in my experience it's taken work it's taken community it's taken spiritual discipline it's taken prayer it's taking uh for a time, it took some almost some legalism in my own life to put distance between me and the sin and to give my brain a chance to reform. But here's the thing, and this, this gets down to, to neuroscience. Jesus says, uh, Corinthians, Paul writes, if anyone is in Christ, he or she is a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. And in neuroscience, it tells us that our brains are plastic. Not literal plastic, but it is malleable. It is changeable. We can rewire our brains by our choices. So, so when we, and some of you have heard me say this before, but that's okay. Repetition is the mother of retention. All right, so you have these brain cells, and the more brain cells fire together, the more they wire together. So, for example, as a buddy of mine, uh, he's, he's passed away, but uh, he was struggling with, with addiction, with uh, substance abuse. But one of the things, he always, he'd go to the bar to play pool. That's why he was, he was going to play pool. He loved playing pool. It was a fun time. So he loved playing pool, but they, where did he go to play pool? Where's oh. <laughs> yeah. So he goes to play pool. Eventually, somebody's going to offer him a beer, and eventually someone offers him drugs. Wow. So his brain has wired together so that the choice to play pool it was really inevitably a choice to do drugs because all these dominoes are linked together and one falls, they all fall. In addiction circles, we talk about rituals, things that we do to precede our addiction. It's like, oh, hey, these sim it's a similar pattern all the time. Now, 
You do have substance abuse, you can do that with uh, gossiping, you can do that with uh, lusting, you can do that with anger. You know, our brains are wired through years of habit, okay? Somebody insults me. What's my go-to? Well, that's a, that's a reflex. That's a habit. That's But because our brains are plastic, by, by choosing differently, we can, those connections can atrophy and we can build other connections. And through habits, spiritual disciplines, we can form those habits. So we, can, we are free, we're, we're no longer slaves to what we used to do, we can make different choices. Okay? So let me get verses 12 through 14. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its desires. And do not offer any parts of its sin as weapons for unrighteousness. But as those who are alive from the dead, offer yourselves to God and all the parts of yourselves to God as weapons for righteousness. For sin will not rule over you because you are not under the law, but under grace. Okay. Um, so yours says weapons, which yeah, version like is that? that. Yeah, my instruments in yeah, mind. My, my yeah, instruments yeah. of righteousness. Yeah. Um, yeah, as weapons for righteousness. Yeah, what, yeah. what version is your baby at? Uh, CSB. Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, contemporary is Christian, or Christian, Christian Standard Bible or contemporary? Uh -huh. no, no, contemporary Christian. English Bibles is one of them. Like, anyway. Um, so, yeah, so, so you, you think about this because. We're talking about slavery, right? Slavery implies there's a master. There's somebody else in charge. Uh, N.T. Wright, I mentioned earlier, I almost forgot. He, he had this really great illustration. Um, <clears throat> okay, so ancient, not ancient, or medieval world, you have feudal lords. Okay, you have a lord over a land. And then you have the, the servants, the peasants, okay? And they would live, you know, they would actually pay rent. You, you live on the Lord's land. You owe the Lord your taxes. And if the Lord wants to go to war, he calls you up and you're, you're bound to it. You, you serve the Lord, okay? So it's kind of like, kind of like mafia. It's like protection racket, okay? You know, he makes sure the, the land is free of bandits and stuff, and in return, you owe him your life. So you live over here on this lord's land, and this lord is a cruel lord. High taxes, very demanding. Every year he wants to go out to war, and he says, okay, grab your... your uh, your plows and your shovels and everything, beat them into swords and spears and come with me and we're going to go murder and plunder and da-da-da. Weapons of unrighteousness. That's where I think that, that's, that is a helpful. Now, you get tired of this eventually and you move across the stream to a new lord. This one is kind and gentle. You know, you still owe him your life, but he doesn't come saying, okay, uh, let's use your tools to go fight wars. But it says, hey, we're going to use your tools and, and come over here. We're going to build a school. And come over here. We're going to build a hospital. Instruments, weapons, tools. Of righteousness but because you moved across the border this one over here still comes over and says hey no you still owe me pay me taxes pay me rent pay me you know come fight my battles no -uh. I don't live on your land anymore you're no longer my Lord I have a new master 
okay? You're still serving somebody, but now the, the one whom you serve, you serve for good purposes rather than the wicked, okay? All right, and then, how are we doing on time? Um, somebody get 15 all the way to 23. I'll finish it off. <clears throat> 15 to 23. What then, this is New King James, by the way, what then shall we sin because we are not under law but under grace? Certainly not. Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are that one slave whom you obey, whether sin to death or obedience to righteousness? But God be thanked that through your though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. And having set been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. I speak in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you presented your members as slaves of uncleanness and of lawlessness, leading to more law unlaw, more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves of righteousness for holiness. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. What fruit did, did you have then in the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now, having been set free from sin and having become slaves of God, you have your fruit, you have your fruit to holiness and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. <clears throat> so you see, you, you, you still you still owe allegiance to somebody. <coughs> You know, this American idea of I just do what I want, nobody's in charge of me, nobody can tell me what to do. Well, that's not that's not what the Christian way is. Christian way is we have a king, we have a lord, but he's a good king, right? He's a good king, and what he calls me to is life. Peace. Yeah. So so, yes, there are expectations, there are rules, I don't get to do whatever I want, but hey, the stuff that I wanted to do, I love that, what fruit did you get of those times? Uh, you know, sometimes in counseling, I was asked the question, how's that going for you? It's like, okay, so I'm not free to spend all my time looking at pornography, and in doing so, alienating my wife, and ruining my soul and contributing to a uh, business that dehumanizes people. Oh, no. <laughs> I, I'm okay with giving up that freedom. In the same way, oh, I'm, uh, you mean I'm not free to just get blackout drunk and do things and say things I regret and risk drunk driving and killing people? Oh, God's such a party pooper. You know, and that's the lie. Satan comes along and says, oh, God, did God really say about this? Oh, no, no. Don't you know that, that God just doesn't want you to have fun? And it's unfortunately, it's people, we don't really believe it until we've been through it ourselves. And it's like, okay, that, that, wasn't, that, that wasn't as fun as I thought it was going to be. Or it was fun at the time. But then here are all these consequences <laughs> that follow that now I have to deal with. So you're, you're still, even that freedom to do whatever you want, you still end up enslaved because there's these consequences that, that always follow. Okay? That it leads to death. You know, spiritual death, physical death. But the way of God, yeah, there are rules, but it's the way of life. You know, it's like I tell my son, okay, here are the, you can play here, not in the middle of Alvin Pond Road. I'm limiting his freedom, but it's a, it's a limit that gives life. Right. 
Um, any any thoughts, questions? Like one obstacles for people to come to Christ. Is they're so comfortable with their friends and their lifestyle. Yeah. And they see people that have changed and they're not sure they want to do that. But they, they're not sure that it's worth all that. You know, I know somebody that they've lost two or three dear people in their life in the last two to three years. And those people are involved in things that end up shortening their life. Yeah. You know, and we have that every day yeah. in our nation. I, I think someone said that there was over over a hundred thousand overdoses, mm -hmm. overdose deaths in 2021. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, before the pandemic, it used to be like it's, thirty and forty thousand, and this it went two and a half times more. From like just a year or two, yeah. And just the consequences of their family, and wow. it's just you know, like it says that Jesus fed four thousand or six thousand, whatever the number was, and that was just the men. Well, that that number reaches so many more people. Mm -hmm. yeah. But there's so many of them that are caught up in that that don't know the alternative. Yeah, and some of it, um, some of it is I. This is a coping mechanism for I. I don't. I'm unhappy. I don't like the way things are going, and I've I've learned through the trauma of my childhood and early years. I do this. At least I'm numb to the pain, or I get this temporary feeling of euphoria because of the drugs and you're asking me to give up something that doesn't work well but at least it kind of gets me through to take a leap of faith for health and sanity and dealing with reality and when an addict goes through that not only do they have to deal with now present day reality but also all that stuff they've been avoiding and I'm talking from personal experience, all this stuff we've been avoiding for the years of our addiction to now, let me actually go and, and process through a couple of decades worth of trauma. And now if you get through that, if you have a support system like Celebrate Recovery and, and uh, you have a sponsor, you have people like that, you get through that and actually like, oh, sanity. I can think clearly for the first time in, in forever. Now I can actually make choices based on what I want not because I'm fleeing from something. But yeah, to get from here to there. And now so you take it from the addiction, and I think most sin is really some kind of addiction, some sort of coping mechanism with the world around us. You know, Sometimes the tendency of the American church is okay. We, let's lower the expectation. Let let's let's lower. It's like okay. Well, you know, we'll we'll, we'll make it easy for you. But then, but Jesus says, no. You, you count the cost. Count the cost to see if you're going to follow me. And you know, take up your cross daily and follow after me. That that is a high bar. And sometimes as churches, we want to lower the bar and say, okay, no, you don't really have to make any changes. You just close your eyes and, and silently to yourself, pray this, repeat this sinner's prayer after the pastor, and boom, your name's written in the book of life, and you don't have to do anything. I think, I think, I, my wife can tell you that I'm like, I love the King James Version Bible, and I'm even very skeptical about some of the other translations and why they were translated. But hers, I've never looked at that passage of scripture as I've never seen it as clearly as when she said weapons. Because we know through Jesus we have we had victory. Mm -hmm. 
but the war's not done with that victory. That was a battle, and that was a victory, and we're assured of eternal life through our faith, not our works. But that doesn't ever stop our enemy from attacking daily. Mm -hmm. So we're constantly yeah. That actually makes it worse sometimes the attacks. Yeah. yeah. So, so that's why when it comes to like disciple making, it's like don't don't lower the bar of of being. Jesus says, I mean, if we follow Jesus, it's going to change everything. And it's all got to be on the table. Now, it's going to be a, a process. It might be, okay, I'm going to celebrate two steps forward, one step back. Well, okay, we're going to celebrate the step forward. <coughs> but <coughs> come to Jesus, it's all on the table. You know, my, my finances, my hobbies, my politics, my job, you know, uh, I mean, how many, how many more, okay, uh, businesses, is that okay, you're going to work for us, you got to be available seven days a week, and that costs you your, your connection with your, your faith community, well, so be it. <clears throat> Christians, we got to make that choice of, okay. Do I take this job that pays more money but destroys my faith community or my connection to my faith community, or do I make another choice? I think being disciple or being equipped is so huge because the more we know and yield to Christ, the more we gentler, kinder, more loving person. And people can see that Christ is making a difference in their life. And it may go on for five or ten years. They don't see any reason. But something all of a sudden sets something off in their heart. Mm -hmm. And then they decide to start down that journey. Yeah. Yeah, it was... Uh Janice had shared a story of, of somebody, I know the family she was talking about, that been praying for their dad for decades, 95 years old, finally accepts Christ and dies a week later. <laughs> now, God's patience is so much greater than our patience, and his grace is so much greater than, than we can possibly imagine. Um, and that's why it's like, okay, we're talking about the end times and stuff. It's like, wow, Jesus, why don't you just come back? I'm just yeah. tired of this nonsense. But each day is a day for somebody to make that choice to say, no, no, I'm, I'm, I'm coming to join Christ over here. Um, so, and eventually that's going to stop. <laughs> There's going to be a cutoff. I don't know when, but eventually there will be. In the meantime, we just got to keep praying and keep sharing and keep living. So, And not letting it steal your joy. Because that's what he's trying. He's been trying with me all morning. Trying to tell me I feel anxiety. Yeah. I fit actual physical symptoms. And I just am repeating the verse from Luke in your in your patience possess your soul. Yeah. Your patience to have peace. Yeah. Uh, and Philippians 4 is also a good one for anxiety. Um, all right, let me uh, pray for us and we'll get out of here next week, chapter seven. Lord God, thank you for my brothers and sisters and a great conversation we had uh, on your your text, your word, Lord, and, and I pray, Lord, that that's what everybody remembers, your words, not mine, but um, but your truth from uh, uh, your inspired your inspired writings. So please, Lord, watch over us this week. I pray for peace from anxiety. I pray for victory in the battles, and I pray that we will be instruments of righteousness in the world around us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.